All right, uh, welcome. Um, glad to see we didn't lose everybody, but I think, I think the beer kept everybody here, right? Uh, okay, so um, walking away a little bit from the last presentation, which was, which was excellent, um, we're going to be talking more about a use case today, a business use case, a very practical one, um, mobile workloads on OpenStack. Uh, my name is Tim Puyer. I am, uh, hmm, how do I describe myself? I want to describe myself as a developer, uh, but unfortunately I don't get to do a lot of that now. Nowadays I, I mostly script um, automated deployments, so I travel around the world, visit customers, and show them how they can automate their deployments on OpenStack, on uh, software, on AWS, on pretty much any cloud there is, um, and even traditional uh, bare metal type workloads. Uh, my colleagues are going to introduce themselves. Thanks, Tim. So my name is Tyson Laurie. I am one of the DevOps engineers for the Apple and IBM program. Um, as you can see from my slide, I'm actually a wayward Australian that's um, been moved to the United States. Um, and this is a lot of the work that we've done to use OpenStack in a way to speed up the development timeframes and deliver all of the apps that we do as part of the partnership. Cool, and my name's uh, Glenn Hickman. I'm the second of the Australian DevOps engineers on the Apple IBM program. That's extremely bright. I've been in Chicago the last seven months and I don't think I've seen anything that bright before. So it's good to be here though. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna do the first thing that you should never do with a presentation, and that is do a demo. And part of that, we're going to talk about um, how we sort of arrived at uh, this point in time on our program, why we've adopted certain tools and techniques, one of which obviously being OpenStack. So as Tim alluded to before, we're not OpenStack developers. We're not shaping the product at all. We're just big users of the product, and we can see a lot of value in it. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about how we've integrated it into what we do. Uh, we're going to talk about how we do other things on our program in terms of continuous delivery and stuff like that. And uh, First off, we're going to do is kick off a demo because it takes about 30 minutes, roughly, to uh, to finish. So the the OpenStack side of it, so the provisioning of the infrastructure is pretty quick. It's about 15 seconds. But what we do on top of that, which saves us a lot of time in the long run, is deploy our entire software stack on top of that using the orchestration tools. So it saves us a lot of time, especially when we're spinning up anywhere from 70 to 100 environments. So it's kind of a big saver for us. We have a very small team um, in Chicago. There's four of us in Chicago and Tyson in New York. So we manage 100 plus servers, spinning them up and down all the time with a very small team, thanks to OpenStack and some other pretty cool tools. So what we'll do is we will... Now this tool here is Tim's baby, and he's going to talk a bit more about this later on. Um, you should understand everything you see on the board. <laughs> if you don't, um, <clears throat> we'll in, exploit it. In 25 words or less, this is basically a, a, one of our blueprints for one of our environments. It's somewhat reduced, just in terms of trying to get it to finish in terms of a, uh, a presentation. So without going into too much detail, there's some, there's some application servers, the database servers, some networks and stuff. So We'll kick it off and we'll close our eyes and hopefully in 30 minutes you'll be able to see something on the other end. You gonna take us through the source before you provision it? Uh, depends how detailed we wanna get. <laughs> yeah, okay, so basically the way this tool works from a high level is um, you define your server blueprint so that's um, essentially each image that you want to have, the image types, flavors, stuff like that, networks. Um, so all the kind of things you traditionally would always do when you're using OpenStack to provision environments. Um, all these in the background there, you can see all these little yellow boxes. Now what they are, they're our software components. So we effectively componentize each of the bits of software we want to deploy to that stack. Um, but we don't just sort of deploy it and walk away, we deploy it and everything's configured and in cases where we do high availability, so we're clustering databases or application servers or cloud or whatever it is that we do on our program, our tooling takes care of all this. So effectively we spent 12 months doing a lot of automation, um, so we're obviously using OpenStack to kick everything off and to get the platform ready for us to deploy our software stack. And it's all through point and click type stuff, which is pretty cool. 
So in the source, you'll have, oh, how much do you want to go into? Essentially, it's broken down into the different types of components we've got on there. So we've got application servers, analytic servers, database servers. There's individual configuration for each one. So we have a unique configuration file for a given environment. So that's got like server names, uh, flavor specifications. So we can tell like for a, a test box as opposed to a production box, we can specify different uh, memory sizes and CPU sizes and stuff like that. And that's all built into the configuration that sits in behind the blueprint that you see in the background there. So they sort of work together. We use the heat orchestration engine to talk to OpenStack and it builds it out for us. We'll go into a bit more detail later. And yeah, well, why don't we go ahead and kick that off? Yeah, because um, we'll need 30 minutes. And we'll jump back over to the side deck. Alrighty, so while that's working, it's magic in the back end, and Tim will go through it all and how it transformed to heat and how all of that hangs together. I'm going to talk a bit about the use case. Um, so as I said, this is used for the Apple and IBM partnership. Um, we were building these apps to transform enterprises, right? That's, that's the, the amazing way of doing it. We're trying to make it the best user experience possible. Um, we're developing, or oh, we developed actually, 100 apps in partnership with Apple. Um, designers, developers, uh, small teams, geographically dispersed, um, developing all of these applications. The APIs, they need environments, there's a lot of changes, we do sprints. Um, it's all incredibly powerful. Behind all of that is a scale roughly this, except even more complex now because we have all of the implementations of those apps. Again, we're using a whole bunch of amazing tools, um, OpenStack being one of them, and the worldwide team is across you know, the usual suspects, so North America, uh, we've got development centers in uh, Cupertino, um, Chicago, Atlanta, then we've got Toronto up in Canada, uh, we've got people in London, India, Brazil, China, you know, it's, it's, it's every continent you could possibly touch on. Um, and that brings issues again around access and speed and networks, et cetera. Uh, the apps are distinguished with, well, we're over 100 now. Um, at that point in time, we had 680 APIs across all of those servers. Um, 100 plus compute nodes running behind those um, apps. And we obviously had organizational pressures. I mean, every business case does, right? We can't have an unlimited team of people. Um, so as Glenn pointed out, there's actually only four people in Chicago and myself in New York running all of those servers. So that wouldn't have been possible without orchestration tools and without the automation from heat and doing all of that. Yeah, magic. I mean, there's definitely, uh, uh, and we're gonna get to this next slide, but causes for change. I mean, uh, we talk about organizational changes, you know, uh, it's kind of big when the CEO promises 100 apps in, in a year, right? So these were the pressures, uh, the previous side were the pressures that these guys were facing, um, you know, when we, when they came in, to me and, and we talked uh, in depth about what, what can we actually do to solve this problem? Yep, Tim has helped us quite a bit. <laughs> um, so obviously, they're all the causes for change. Um, you'll encounter them on pretty much every IT project. Um, I probably won't go through them in too much detail, uh, other than say, um, you know, it, for us, it was all about maintaining all the different implementations and variations and flavors of, um, of that and all of the different apps. Um, so our goals, that drove us to these. We wanted to be able to do the quick iterations that the development teams and the designers were doing for the apps with the servers, with the changes, um, being able to spin up multiple development environments, having slightly different alterations in them or different streams of work um, from the development teams and be able to compare the differences, compare the outcomes, um, Obviously, we had to do that in a way that didn't increase the cost um, by having all of those server environments because that would never have been approved. 
Um, and then obviously uh, provide visibility. So we have um, tapped into a whole bunch of the OpenStack APIs and a bunch of other things, monitoring tools, to provide all of that visibility end to end to everybody in our program from executives through to developers, testers, et cetera, so they can tell what the impact is. So greater capability, greater flexibility, less cost. Essentially, yeah. That was simple. <laughs> so um, those goals led us to these four questions. Um, and we apply these questions at every layer that we do now. So whether that's uh, the infrastructure, um, whether that's automation, APIs, apps, these are the questions we ask on how to uh, implement it with such a small team. Um, and these form the basis for everything we do. Um, and as you'll see in, well, now, Tim's going to take you through the tooling that we used to answer these questions. All right, so when, when uh, Tyson and Glenn first approached me, um, you know, they, they basically came to me with the, the, the problems that they've laid out in front of you. Like, we have uh, a limited amount of people, we have a lot of uh, applications that we have to prepare um, in dev test, QA, and production. Um, we need to give these environments to our developers right away, um, or at least as quickly as possible. And you know, the old way of doing things was just not working for them. Um, and you know, I was very happy that they came to me because we had a new way of doing things. And it was built on top of OpenStack, and it was built on top of Heat. Um, and basically what we do is we utilize Heat technology, right, which is you know, uh, uh, infrastructure as code, right, and we define the topologies that we need for our workloads. So um, whatever those applications are uh, that we're deploying, um, pulling the latest code from Git repos, uh, building it, and then deploying it into a production-like system so they can be tested um, fully and functionally, and then moved up to you know, a truer QA system and eventually into an actual production system. Um, and they like that approach very much. Uh, and in fact, you know, the, the middle layer that you see here with, with Urban Code Deploy um, gave us the capability where, you know, when we first started this approach, Heat may be kind of punted a little bit on the software side of things. It was very good at standing up uh, network storage and compute, but when it came to um, the software that goes onto that compute and how you connect all those together, um, at the time, it did not have a great solution for that. It's a little bit better now, um, but yet Urban Code Deploy provides a lot more capability than um, the heat tools that you um, uh, build into your images now are capable of doing. So <clears throat> we started looking at, okay, great, so OpenStack's the way. Um, we're going to use Urban Code on top of that. We're going to use heat. Um, but dang, is it hard to manage OpenStack, all right? Now, we admittedly told you up front that we're not OpenStack developers, okay? Um, and I'm actually thinking about taking that certification exam for OpenStack administration, but I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of stuff with OpenStack, you know, internally. I've done a lot of stuff with OpenStack externally with customers. Um, but, you know, it's an intimidating thing. There's lots and lots of projects in OpenStack. Um, and maintaining a, a readiness, uh, production level readiness with security um, and vulnerability testing and making sure that it's up and running 24-7. Um, like I said, we have a small team. We didn't want to take on that responsibility. So when we acquired Blue Box, we immediately reached out to them and said, I think you guys would be a great fit for us. Actually, a bit before we acquired Blue Box. It was, a, it was officially before we acquired <laughs> yeah, Blue Box. Yeah, officially before. Um, so, and that worked out to be a very good fit for us, right? Because Blue Box takes on all those headaches that they're very good at managing um, and provides us a, a ready-to-use production environment for our workloads. Um, and the best part was that Urban Code Deploy, since it's built on top of... Um, heat uh, technology um, and provides us a heat editor, which we, we saw a little bit earlier and I'll, we're going to see again later from the demo, um, allows us to easily build out heat templates, um, which are obviously com compatible with OpenStack. And, and one thing to add there, um, probably, and I think you're going to get to it, is mobile apps are very, very different um, in that they can be region specific, they could be implementation specific, they can be user specific. Um, and so we have to handle those variations and those workloads. Um, and that's something that Blue Box allowed us to repeat over and over again um, yep. with the you know, variances. Absolutely. So Heat, heat and, and specifically uh, Urban Code Deploy's uh, 
with we call it every code deployment patterns, but but it, it gives us the functionality to be able to define heat templates that parameterize out the differences between these different uh, types, these different technologies, um, the different customizations that Tyson is talking about. Um, and now that we have Blue Box Local, which we said this in the beginning, um, we kind of knew that this that Blue Box Local was coming. Um, this is the perfect opportunity. We take the same exact workloads that we defined with our heat templates, and we can run it locally, or we can run it in a dedicated fashion where um, Blue Box is managing it in the cloud for us, or we're running it in our own personal data center. Um, it doesn't really matter to us. Um, and in fact, we're working on the process of, of migrating from one data center to the next right now, and there's very little change that actually is having to occur because of that. Um, so. We were very excited about the heat technology in Urban Code, and uh, I was very excited to help these guys uh, in, in building out that technology and proving it out in a real, um, you know, enterprise class uh, application. All right. Uh, just before we go any further, I'll just uh, want to make one clarification that Tim mentioned before about the small team. Uh, the Apple IBM program is probably eight or nine hundred people, I'm not sure the exact count, but there's a lot. But the DevOps team, which services that entire program, and not just environments, but continuous integration, build deploys, releases, the whole lot, is Tyson and I, three more, plus Tim. And Tim's sort of a... He's a guest. Yeah. Uh, half, so half time. He's an honorary half member time. of our team. One eight. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the beauty of the tooling, uh, and that obviously includes OpenStack, really makes life for us uh, a lot more simple than what it could be. And given that Bluebox wasn't our initial cloud platform, we actually moved from a non-open stack cloud provider, uh, a lot of pain and heartache using them initially, um, mainly around the fact that uh, the provisioning times are very slow, very little intricate control over how you want to uh, define your actual images and stuff like that. So it wasn't uh, cost effective. Um, so Bluebox was, a, was an obvious choice, especially the fact that it's open stack engineered. So that made life for us uh, a lot more simple. So just a bit more background about our, our, our program and the sort of stuff that we do within our team in terms of our broader DevOps type, type stuff. So we have a whole, uh, well, starting initially obviously with the provisioning of environments. So using OpenStack in Heat, we've got a whole uh, uh, virtual machine catalog, uh, a whole bunch of different flavors, different networks, basically all the building blocks that you need to build out a customized or uh, a repetitious type test or production environment. So. We have a catalog, and you saw a bit of that before at the start, where you saw the, 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 the environment map with all the images and the components and the networks and stuff. So we have a whole bunch of those which we use um, to either spin up our dedicated production environments or our dedicated test environments or our ad hoc performance environments. So the beauty of OpenStack is we can, if we get a request to say, can you spin us up a production-like performance environment? How, lo how much lead time do you need? I said, well, when's lunch sort of thing. You know, we can have it basically up and sitting there for them within an hour. And that includes uh, the full security model over the top. It's not just a bare bones installed product. It's configured. It's highly available if it needs to be. Uh, all the configuration is done. The security model is applied. All the, all the role-based accesses and permissions are all being set. So it's essentially how it would be if you wanted to deliver it to a customer and say it's production ready. So that's all done through automation. And we don't have to talk to anybody because it goes to Slack. So yeah, I don't have to. Yeah. We've learned very quickly that DevOps people don't like speaking to actual human beings, so it's <laughs> better to use emails and stuff like that. So, um, so the good things with OpenStack, obviously, is repeatability. We get environments that are the same every time. Um, when we first joined the program, they were building environments manually, and I don't think any two environments were actually the same. Um, we do obviously do the full pipeline, so the developers just have to just tag their stuff in Git. We pick it up and basically do the rest for them. Uh, We've got a whole other, other value add stuff on top. So we have a broad range of monitoring and uh, server performance uh, type sort of stuff. Um, we've also got a whole collaboration side of our program. So we've got basically when, when the developers kick off a, a build process by whatever tag they're specifying, uh, we've got communication channels like HipChat and Slack that basically bring that information back to the developers as soon as it happens type thing. Uh, and as Tim mentioned before, with the use of urban code in the background, doing, kicking off these sort of sorts of tasks, it, it's quick, it's on demand, and um, no one actually has to do anything really. As I mentioned before, we've got a whole security model on top. So using OpenStack, we've got availability zones, security groups. So 
We've got the petitioning of, of infrastructure, so you've got true high availability using availability zones in, in OpenStack. Um, what else? And it's also very scalable. So obviously one of the big things of OpenStack is being able to ramp up an environment. Say you might have seasonal type requirements. So if you're a retail type customer, maybe the, I think you call it Thanksgiving here, it's probably a big time to buy some stuff. So if you want to tag on an extra half a dozen servers, sure. You kick off your blueprint, it adds it up and it builds out the server pattern. Yeah, and the, the ability to add that directly into your heat document, right? So you, you're defining that as being a prereq for your, your, your environment up front, right? I want the ability to start off with two nodes and if CPU um, utilization goes over 30%, then add two more nodes, right? I mean, and that's defined in the actual heat document. I mean, it, it's a modern day age, right? Um, things are completely different than 10 years ago. Absolutely, and you know, as a father of many children, I detest wastage, so the best thing with having a very scalable product is really good, efficient use of resources. So, as I mentioned before, we had a non-open cloud backed cloud provider initially. Um, I think even in the heat of battle, our servers were running at about 0.9% CPU, so we weren't exactly getting good value for money for what we were paying for. So now we actually get better bang for buck. Okay, so this slide's basically giving you a full view of what I just basically mentioned about how we use OpenStack and, and how we use other tooling to provide what we call full stack automation. So as I touched on before, we want to be able to not just provision an empty VM that someone can log on to and have a look around, but actually have a working environment that users can connect apps up to. Because the whole point of what we do is to provide a middle layer for our growing collection of mobile um, applications. So. This stack is essentially the, the middleware that helps the, that provides the connectivity back into the, the customer sources of record. So, to t lightly touch on that, the stack automation, obviously we use um, Urban Code Deploy with patterns and uh, OpenStack to build out our two base layers, so the platform and obviously the model, so effectively sizing the environment and stuff like that. And then, as Tim mentioned before, we use Urban Code Deploy to basically deploy out all our software components. So, in Urban Code Deploy, we effectively have a component for each piece of middleware that we deploy. So for example, if we're using WebC Liberty, there's a component for that, and it's versioned. So we know exactly what version of that product is in what environment. So another ancillary benefit of using Urban Code Deploy is having that full traceability of what you've actually got out there. So you know, if you've got 100 environments and someone says, uh, are all your QA environments at the same specification? We can say, yes, they are. Because you can actually see there that you can see what version of what component, which is a software, Piece, is deployed to that environment. Uh, and also I mentioned before about configuration, so we have the whole thing hooked up as well. So any sort of uh, clustering that needs to be done, so uh, when you're provisioning servers through OpenStack, you might be building out a dozen app application servers, but it doesn't technically wire them together and make them a useful cluster. So we do that with Urban Code Deploy. We have processes that run over the top and it basically binds the whole thing together, makes it into a usable system. And then there's the application, which is the whole point of the thing, which is the, the mobile applications developed on the Apple Library and program run on top of the stack that we deploy. I think we've kind of gone through that one. I think I might have, yes. um, Do you want me to switch to the outcome or switch back to the demo? Uh, keep going. I'll just see where I'm at. Cool. So while we're waiting for that to finish, um, I thought I'd go through a bit of, a few of the benefits that we've had. Um, We've mentioned a few of them. Obviously, was um, total cost of ownership is quite reduced, or even if it's similar cost, we actually get way more benefit out, benefit out of it. Um, one of the things uh, that came into effect with the use of heat and urban code was automation. So there's many tools out there that do automation now, um, and even heat's gotten stronger at doing what it does. Um, but we saw a reduction from five weeks to uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and that's been gradual over time as we've gotten better with um, understanding how OpenStack works. Um, we had a few networking glitches <laughs> ourselves uh, initially with routers and um, internal networks, et cetera. Um, and if you saw the previous session, you would understand that uh, with containers, that's going to become a bit easier for workload management. Yeah, that'll, that'll be the next step. <laughs> yeah, next step. Um, it was a turnkey solution, so from start to finish, you saw the stack model. We um, Developers can drive things through tags when they're trying to test out development environments um, and different apps. So 
you know, if we've got a, a suite of industry apps um, and there's industry APIs from a model, we've put all of that out together, um, all different versions, and we can test it all, um, including the sizing, the performance requirements, maybe some changes in the security model, et cetera, um, and test it all together. Um, we're obviously a smaller, dedicated team. Um, so, you know, uh, a good example is performance environments. I don't want to spend my day trying to repair performance environments once we've broken them. Um, that's never fun. Uh, so we just spin up a new one. That's usually easier. Um, and then obviously the version management of all of that, but the biggest thing has been, yeah, total cost of ownership from team size to time wasted in delivery, all of that comes together. Um, and that left us about a 40% reduction um, by switching to OpenStack, so that was, that was yeah, and, amazing. And, I mean, uh, you know, I want to get the point across that when we talk about mobile apps, we're not talking about something that, that you just, you know, throw together and submit to the App Store, right? Um, these are enterprise-ready mobile apps. These are things, uh, you know, have backends with adapters that connect into all of your enterprise um, applications like SAP and Oracle and, and you know, all the different, you know, uh, enterprise-type applications that, that, that most companies are running um, and they want to get information out of, right? So there's a lot that has to, more than I even realized before I agreed to work with you guys, <laughs> about, you know, what you have to do to actually get these mobile apps to run. Um, and connect to them, and, and you know we're building industry-specific mobile apps, but everything's tailored for a particular customer, right? So we have to be able to provide adapters and um, integrations and deployment automation for a lot of different um, possible outcomes. I should way of uh, describing it. Yeah, variations. Um, so it, it, it's 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 almost like heat. And, and Urban Code give us the ability to have a self-documented process, right? So there's not one, I mean, these guys are invaluable, and I'm not gonna say that they're not, but there's not one person up here that couldn't leave the program for whatever reason, and somebody wouldn't be able to find out, well, okay, well, how does the process actually work? Or right? at least keep running for three months. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Until they figure it out. You Aussies, you get the, the three-month uh, vacations. Yeah. Americans, we, we don't get that in the Americas. <clears throat> All right. Did we, did it finish? It's almost done, right? Almost done? Okay. So, outcomes. Well, I think we've kind of covered the outcomes. Yeah, what I want to cover is the next steps for us while we're waiting for that to, to finish. Okay. Um, so, you know, obviously we've got some big changes. Um, we weren't an early adopter of containers. Um, we're still trying to wait for OpenStack and containers to figure out which one wins. Um, and oh, how sorry. it's done. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, wins is a strong word. Yes. Um, uh, how, how OpenStack will, uh, and containers will, will, will live symbiotically together, for, yeah. Yeah, together like, like a happy marriage. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's probably the biggest next steps for us mm -hmm. um, and understanding um, even larger scale um, use cases of OpenStack. So we currently have you know, a fair number of servers, but as we grow, you know, uh, another use case that's that's hit us is uh, different regions of the app needing to hit, you know, and put their workloads on region-specific clouds. So we have to manage all of that. Um, you know, the current use case I think is 12 data centers um, with a different usage of the app, a different style of the app, different performance. Um, people do things differently in different countries, uh, amazingly. So uh, that's something that we're going to approach um, with the use of OpenStack, um, the use of Blue Box, um, and try and roll that out in a way that, again, scales. Yeah. Um, and it's, at this time, it's less of about um, the number of apps that we're trying to support, but again, I think it's just a, a scaling factor. Uh, I mean, even even earlier today, you were talking about the full stack deployment and how much that is helping you manage and maintain these environments. Because, you know, if you have a rogue developer that that gets out and gets access to <laughs> something and maybe adds a bit of code to one of those environments, um, you know, you, you don't really care because as soon as it stops working, you just tear it down and throw a new one up. Yeah. Right. And any code local changes that that person has made, um, who shouldn't be making those changes there, um, now have lost that changes and they'll learn quickly, as a developer, I can say that I've done this before, um, they'll learn quickly not to do that. Yeah, I mean, my, my background's development, so I don't really want to delete people's code, but um, <laughs> we did find that uh, we made our development environment so easily accessible and so visible by everybody in the program um, 
and they had access to them, that they loved playing around with them. Um, I think it was nearly a challenge just to see how many times they could break a development environment and how many times we had to spin it back up. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. Okay. Would you say developer happiness has gone up? I would have to say developer happiness has <laughs> gone up. All right, so are we ready to flip back over? Well, I, I mean, let's let's uh, let's just flip it back over. I mean, it's, it's not done running yet. Just full confession here. Um, I probably spoke too long at the start before I kicked it off. So, but um, one point I'd like to mention though before we change screens. Oh, sorry. That's right. Is that um, the theme of this summit this week is is around OpenStack, obviously, and um, the directions going in, you know, the the fantastic changes that are coming up. Uh, what's available now and stuff like that, but there was a question I heard in a, a session the other day, which was, you know, is it production ready? And from our perspective, yes, it is. So that's probably not a really exciting thing for developers to know, but I think it's a pretty exciting thing for those that foot the bill and pay the money for these things. I actually, like to know the fact that OpenStack, in our sense, and we're using it quite broadly on our program, is production ready for us. It's working well. It totally suits the style of how we work in our teams. We're very agile, so. Um, you know, we need to have a, an on-demand type sort of approach to providing environments and then obviously then put in the whole software stack on top of that. So it kind of works for us. Um, what I'll do now is bravely go into the tool itself and hopefully we'll... Uh, so it's not far away. Hopefully you don't have to cut and run. So what you're looking at here is, is basically a, a, a dashboard of, of currently executing processes. Well, now what you're looking at is Glenn's favorites. There we go. It's actually up and running now. You can, that's effectively, we stole one of our new production environments to demo today. We didn't spin up a production environment. It takes about 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes to do the full thing. So we kind of created a, a slightly, which, slightly hobbled. Which, which may sound like a long time, 45 minutes, right? I, I mean, how, if it took 50 minutes, it, it's still down from what, three and a half, four weeks when we first started on this journey? Five. five, wow. So it's down from five, right? And these are like approved, sanctioned, um, sanitated, or sanit sanitized, sanitated is not a word, sanitized, uh, you know, uh, environments that developers can actually deploy on, right? These aren't just like homegrown, um, I'm just gonna throw something out there and it's gonna have tons of security holes because I'm a developer and I don't care about firewalls, right? Um, these things are, 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 are groomed by these guys um, and placed out there so that uh, developers can use them and, and actually test code in, in, like I said, a production-like environment. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is actually what you see when you log on to the IBM Mobile First console. It's not the most exciting console, but essentially what gets deployed into here is all the connectors that connect the mobile de uh, applications on the mobile devices into some various uh, customer source of record. So um, what we do by default when we spin up one of these environments is we put a, our own little uh, application holder on there. It doesn't actually do anything. It's just there to show that the, the server's up. You can see the console. Um, if we had a bunch of apps deployed to here and a bunch of connectors, we could go through those and show them to you, but that's, that's the next step in the continuous integration pipeline is deploying the artifacts that we also hold in, in urban code. Yep. So effectively, um, I talked before about components, so each uh, urban code component, which is just like a container or, or a holder, we have one for each of our uh, middleware software stack items. We also have one, a holder, for each of the 200 plus applications that we deliver to these software stacks. And again, they're just a component and they have versions and we can see what versions have tr transgressed through, you know, development, test production type sort of thing. Yep. So, so when, when when I just don't want to confuse things. Uh, I mean, um, Urban Code is, is a, a utilizer of of heat, um, but a provider of software automation, just similar to what you might find with uh, Chef or Puppet or Salt. Um, Ansible's a little bit different, but you know that's okay. Uh, but it's it, it it does things in a little bit different way, and obviously uh, IBM it, it's a sold product. Um, but these guys utilized it um, by basically building out components that you see here um, from the palette designer. And these components represent actual software that's getting installed on those nodes. Um, these nodes are uh, resource types from heat. Um, and we can flip over and see the actual source. Um, if you've ever looked at a heat template, 
Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with heat, this is going to look pretty intimidating, um, but it's really not. Uh, and our diagramming tool, um, just like Urban Code's philosophy from the very get-go, is let's make things simple, let's keep things visual until we need to go deeper into code. Um, and ultimately, when you run one of these things, uh, what you come out with is a process that you can dig into, um, which tells you about uh, everything that, that has executed on this system, and you can dig in and actually see uh, the actual uh, command output from each of those processes, right? Um, so we, we try our best to keep everything very simple and, and uh, visual as much as possible. Um, it, it, visual, I know a lot of people give it a hard time because, well, I can't do everything from a command line. Well, we have a command line client. It's just that most people in this space, right, that are dealing with all these different kinds of technologies, frankly, nobody has all those skills, right? Um, so we provide plugins and we provide a visual context so that you don't have to be an expert in everything to be able to accomplish a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, did I finish? Uh, no? Not quite, but what you can right. see here is this is the, obviously you're familiar with the OpenStack Horizon uh, dashboard. This is the blue box implementation of that. So here you can see up top here, there's the, like I said, there's only a very small pattern that we deployed. Um, the, the width of the pattern doesn't really affect the provisioning in terms of how many application servers, because it actually builds these things concurrently. Um, but the depth does, obviously. So the more software stack you dump onto it, the longer it takes. Because obviously software in most traditionally needs to be uh, installed and configured in a serial fashion. So we kind of, we're limited by the duration of the install process. But you can see there's the top four servers were spun up 30 minutes ago. So we, we, we've gotten down to the wire here. We got one minute for questions. <laughs> Is, is there anybody that has any questions? If not, you can you can you know find us afterwards. Um, we'll be happy to answer them. But and the slide back goes up. Switch. Oh yeah yeah. So let's switch back to the um, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, what is it? Five. Okay. So if uh, if anybody has a uh, barcode reader, um, you can take a picture of this. Uh, this will just take you a link to the slide share. Um, that we have up online that you can read back through this material um, in a much more organized fashion than we've managed to explain it today. <laughs> All right, well, I, if there are no questions, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to get out of this really bright light. Um, and thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, and please check out the slide share.